So our next speaker has a, a very interesting resume. He's a, a physicist and former Air Force uh, test pilot. He's done a bunch of interesting things. He's, uh, he's worked at Blue Origin and was also involved in a Google Lunar X Prize team for, for several years. And recently he's founded a company called Positron Dynamics to uh, advance uh, antimatter propulsion. So uh, we'll now uh, have him talk about that. Uh, Ryan Weed, please, uh, I've got your... You're up. All right. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Zach, and uh, thanks, Dr. Warden and the Breakthrough team for inviting me to talk to you guys today uh, about antimatter. I think I'm the only antimatter representative here. Um, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, Sonny brought this up. I think I might be the only reaction engine uh, representative here as well. So big shoes to fill, um, and let's jump right into it. So started Positron Dynamics uh, several, several years ago uh, based on some work uh, I did down in Australia uh, in investigating how positrons interact with matter. Um, and it's been quite a journey so far. And here's the landscape, and you, everyone's probably very familiar with this landscape. Uh, of course, with current technology, it'll take you know, thousands of years uh, many tens of thousands of years, actually, to get where we want to go. So I started thinking about this several years ago, and, and, uh, and really, uh, it's all about energy density for a reaction engine. And antimatter simply can't be beat. It has the highest energy density out there. At about 90 megajoules per microgram, it's about eight orders of magnitude higher in energy density uh, than anything chemical, ion, uh, and five orders of magnitude higher than... Uh, even nuclear. So to, to, to demonstrate that, if you had, uh, say, 10 grams, 10 micrograms of, uh, or 10 grains, grains of salt, anti-salt, and you were to smash that against uh, normal table salt, you would get uh, about uh, 6 million pounds worth of uh, rocket fuel out of, uh, out of that reaction. Uh, so incredibly high energy density, uh, and that's what it originally interested me in positron physics. <clears throat> However, there are lots of problems to antimatter, one of which is uh, it's very difficult to create. Um, and the main methods of creating antimatter involve uh, basically taking a lot of energy uh, and turning it into particles, velocity, smashing that into uh, solid matter. You can create pair production, electron positrons or antiprotons and protons, and then finding ways of separating those two particles very inefficient process and takes a lot of energy to do. Uh, and we've created less than a nanogram of antimatter. Uh, so that's not enough to create a rocket out of. Uh, so that's the first problem. What's the second problem? The second problem is even if you've created uh, your micrograms or even your grams of antimatter, the challenge is you can't store it anywhere. Uh, unfortunately, when antimatter hits matter, it annihilates into energy uh, and you lose it. So people have come up with ways to store antimatter. They generally involve very strong magnetic fields and electric fields. Um, and so the state of the art there uh, is a penning trap, which I've demonstrated up there. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you can only store uh, very nanograms, femtograms of matter in a realistic magnetic field. Um, and that's called the Briun limit. So that's another challenge. So the third challenge involves, is say, say you're able to store enough antimatter. Um, and the next challenge is how do you use it? Because when you annihilate antimatter, you generally get very high energy gamma rays, um, which means they tend to go through everything, uh, which is a problem for a rocket, because if you just explode, uh, have a, a source of gamma rays isotropically emitted, you're not going to get any thrust out of that. So the challenge is to uh, transfer that gamma ray energy into something more useful, like a charged particle. Uh, and so the original concept for antimatter Eugene Sanger came up with in the 1950s uh, was that he would be able to reflect gamma rays uh, and produce thrust uh, by reflecting the gamma rays, which isn't realistic. So we need to find a way to transfer the energy into a charged particle. So I'm not an anti-proton person. I'm a positron person, anti-electrons. Uh, so why are we using positrons? Well, Turns out they're about 2,000 times lighter. 
they're about 2,000 times easier to create. Uh, and actually, if you've ever had a PET scan, uh, you may have actually swallowed some positrons uh, because you can create radioisotopes that emit positrons continuously. Uh, and that's what we use in our lab uh, in Livermore is that we have a radioisotope of sodium that emits uh, positrons. Uh, so it's a lot easier to deal with than antiprotons. So another benefit of positrons is that when you annihilate a positron and an electron, you get a much lower energy gamma ray, um, which turns out is much easier to convert into a charged particle uh, to use in propulsion. So the real bottleneck in using positrons or any antimatter particle is that when they're created, they are created very hot energetic. So you need to be able to cool them down uh, to near thermal energies in order to be able to, uh, to use them with realistic electric and magnetic fields. This process is typically uh, you know, 0.1 to 0.7% efficient. You lose most of the antimatter you create. Uh, so back in 2011, when we were starting this project, we realized that moderation was the real key to being able to produce uh, a very high intense antimatter beam, cold beam. Uh, so we got funding from the Teal Foundation to try this out, this new concept of using combining field-assisted moderation and very high electric fields uh, in solid materials that had long positron lifetimes and combining that with an E cross B extraction technique uh, for charged particles to improve the moderation efficiency. So using a radioisotope and using a very efficient moderator, we can kind of overcome those two initial problems of production and handling because we don't want to, we're not even considering trapping the positrons. We want to use them right as they're created. So the propulsion mechanism that we've been working on uh, is illustrated there. It's based on a radioisotope decaying, creating a very hot positron. We then produce, uh, we then run it through our moderator to create a cold positron, uh, interacting that positron with uh, a dense state of deuterium we then produce a charged particle, and that produces our thrust. Uh, I won't talk about magnetic fields or magnetic nozzles today. I think it's not really within the scope. But uh, suffice to say, if, you, if you're able to block half of the isotop, uh, isotropic distribution, you can create pro propulsion, uh, even if you don't have magnetic guiding. So in 2016, um, we attempted to measure this cross-section of uh, what's the likelihood of a positron inside of a metal lattice next to a deuterium atom of producing uh, or transferring that ga gamma ray energy into kinetic energy of the deuteron. Uh, this was proposed theoretically in the 90s, but uh, was never measured. And uh, I have some Feynman diagrams up there that kind of describe this process. It's analogous to the Mossbauer effect in nuclear physics. Um, and we're measuring neutrons from, from this process. And so from that, we can back out a cross-section and a probability of this momentum transfer occurring. Uh, and that's sort of the basis of the propulsion system. Now, there's a problem in that if you have a radioisotope and you take it into space, it only lasts as long as you know, a few half-lives, right? So you need to be able to produce more radioisotope uh, as you continue. Um, and so we were thinking about ways of doing this. And since uh, you know, deuterium-deuterium fusion produces an abundant amount of neutrons, if there were a neutron capture cross-section we could use to produce a radioisotope, it would be quite beneficial. And it turns out there is one, uh, 70, 78 krypton to 79 krypton neutron, neutron capture cross-section is quite high at thermal energies. So in effect, you could surround your deuterium-deuterium uh, reactions with uh, basically uh, 10 atmospheres of, of Krypton-78 uh, with less than a meter uh, thickness, and you're able to sort of capture uh, the majority of fast neutrons coming off of the deuterium uh, fusion reactions. And from this, you can generate more Krypton, which is a positron emitter. It also turns out that positrons are quite good at moderating, which is good, because then we can just freeze it onto a uh, a cold head, and, and able, we're able to moderate and produce in the same step. So here's, an ex here's a, a depiction of that fuel cycle where you have fast neutrons uh, with the Krypton-78 blanket uh, producing 
uh, Krypton-79, and then there'll be an enrichment process uh, to produce your hot positron source and moderator. So here's a, a little uh, diagram showing of what, you know, what this whole fuel cycle would look like. Um, obviously, with any fusion concept that, want, that you want to go interstellar with, you're going to have a large mass fraction of deuterium. Um, and if you do the scaling, it's somewhere, uh, somewhere around 70, 80% of your structure has to be fuel. But the interesting thing is you can start this whole thing uh, and basically uh, breed the Krypton-79 to uh, continue to increase your thrust. Uh, and so we, we ran a, couple, a little model that uh, demonstrated this, starting with 100 micrograms of, of Krypton-79 uh, and 10 kilograms of, of Krypton-78. Uh, it takes about three or four months to, uh, to basically breed the amount of uh, Krypton-79 to produce uh, usable thrust, so about 60 newtons. And uh, if you look at the neutron flux there, that's, it's a pretty important parameter because materials start to degrade uh, somewhere around 1 to the 15, 10 to the 15 neutrons per uh, square centimeter. Uh, and so that's kind, of a, that's kind of a limit in terms of we can't just continuously uh, scale the propulsion uh, indefinitely. Um, so this is our team, a couple of positron physicists uh, and a rocket scientist. Um, and uh, we're very honored to have been uh, selected for an NIAC grant this year uh, to continue work on the positron-based uh, propulsion system. So I've got a few minutes left. Um, I'm going to jump into some other research we're working on. Um, so this picture on the left you see is a silicon carbide positron moderator that uh, does the field-assisted moderation and E cross B extraction. Uh, it turns out a lot of the process, semiconductor processing involved in producing these devices uh, may be applicable uh, to building a, uh, a very lightweight, uh, efficient uh, Bragg mirror, which has applications for uh, you know, laser propulsion. And so we were thinking, oh, why don't we just use our semiconductor processing tools, apply that, and see what we can make. And so we did try to make uh, some mirrors using this process with vacuum gaps. And vacuum gaps uh, at a very high aspect ratio are inherently difficult to work with. Um, and so we attempted some uh, gas phase HF etching uh, to produce these vacuum gap structures. And it turned out uh, that we lost all of our optical quality uh, and we had incomplete etching. And that, so that was kind of a disaster. And so we thought, you know, what kind of material could we replace these vacuum gaps with? Um, and so we needed something very light, uh, index of refraction around one, but it's still solid and able to be deposited at uh, nanometers to microns uh, and stable at high temperature. So there are some aerogels out there that are able to do this. So we said, okay, maybe we can deposit aerogel layers and build a mirror uh, based on that. Um, so we did some initial work uh, on that and um, with our partners at uh, University of Minnesota uh, Nanofab facility, we were able to actually uh, spin on a 500 nanometer thick uh, aerogel and then cap it with uh, uh, silicon. And so we think that we can actually turn this into a very lightweight uh, Bragg mirror uh, for applications in laser propulsion. So it's uh, one area of the research that we're continuing to work on. Um, and then one more little thing we're working on, um, just submitted an SBR on this proposal. Um, nuclear batteries have been around since uh, the 50s. Um, and so the idea with a direct charge nuclear battery is that you can take a radioisotope, an alpha emitter, um, and the energetic alpha particles are emitted and they strike a, basically a capacitor plate. Um, and that builds up charge which builds up a voltage, and then you can extract uh, electrical power directly from that. The problem with that is that you uh, qu quite quickly come up against very high potentials and high electric fields, and, and uh, you, you get problems of breakdown. And so that research didn't really go anywhere. Um, and then in the 60s and, and up until the present, uh, people started uh, using semiconductors and scintillator materials to turn alpha particles into photons and eventually free electrons. And, and uh, generate electricity from that. Unfortunately, efficiency of those uh, devices are rather low, typically less than 5%. And so uh, while we're working on the Bragg mirror with aerogel, we realized, hey, why don't we apply this to uh, the direct charge nuclear battery problem 
And we can use an array of uh, aerogel and graphene layers uh, to create a very high efficiency direct charge nuclear battery. Uh, so this is another area that we're working on as well. And we think we get uh, specific powers of up to 100 watts per kilogram. So I'll leave you with a little picture of our uh, positron rocket there uh, heading by Alpha Centauri. And I realize it probably should be turned around the other way, but. <laughs> All right, I'll take questions as well. Thanks. Over here. Hi. Hi. So this scheme requires, on some level, right here, uh, a fusion reactor. And so you know, break-even fusion is always 10 years, 20 years down the road. And I want you to comment maybe about uh, the energy efficiency of the scheme you're proposing in terms of integrating it with a fusion reactor. Yeah, sure. So typically, when you talk about fusion reactors in space, you may be talking about programs that want to use giant lasers to initiate uh, ICF uh, in deuterium targets. Um, and that's rather uh, massive. You're talking about uh, a national ignition facility being launched into space uh, to generate fusion reactions. Um, in this case, we're, we're talking about utilizing positrons, focused beams of positrons, focused impulse beams of positrons to do the same thing as the laser. Uh, and we, th we think that the mass of the, first of all, the krypton, the mass of the krypton is 100 grams. And you can actually you know, freeze a layer of krypton uh, you know, 100 microns thick on a couple hundred square centimeters. Uh, and you can generate enough uh, positrons, given the reaction cross-section that we've measured, uh, to generate fusion in microfusion events in, in uh, thin film uh, deuterated uh, targets. Uh, so we're essentially doing the same thing, except we're not, we don't need the huge mass of the laser driver or the particle driver. So 